Hello, I'm Gus Chass. The intent of this video presentation is to provide you with basic information about the operating system. First, we will look at the major elements that comprise the system and see how these elements function together. Next, you will see how a program gets loaded and executed and how it accomplishes I.O. Then, we will examine the major difference between the various configurations of the operating system. And finally, to tie it all together, we will follow a job through the job processing cycle. Now, when you have finished viewing the videotape, you should be able to identify the major elements of OS, identify the functions that these elements perform, and finally, trace the sequence of steps a job passes through as it is processed by the operating system. Now, let's look at the programs that make up the operating system. They fall into two broad categories, the control program and processing programs. The control program controls the processing of jobs and manages the resources of the data processing system. The processing programs process the daily workload of the installation. Now, what kinds of programs are processing programs? Can you think of any? Well, there are three kinds. They are the language translators, service programs, and application programs. The language translators, of course, provide the programming languages of your installation. Here you see the languages provided by IBM. Have you ever coded in one of these languages? Next are the service programs. They provide programming aids and aids for maintaining the operating system. They include such programs as the linkage editor and loader, which are used to prepare problem programs for execution, utilities for moving data from one device to another and to maintain system data sets, and the sort merge program for rearranging data. Finally, we have the application programs. They do the real work of the installation. Every other part of the operating system exists for the purpose of preparing and processing these programs efficiently. Here you see some examples of application programs. They can be user-written or supplied by IBM. Now let's look at the control program. The components that make up the control program vary with the configuration of the operating system. The functions of the control program, however, do not. So I will cover the control program in terms of the functions it performs. These functions fall into three major categories. Job management, task management, and data management functions. Let's take job management first. What kind of things do you suppose job management is concerned with? Well, the job management area is an area of the operating system that you come into direct contact with. The job management routines represent you and the operator in the system. You communicate your job requirements to job management through the use of the job control language. Just as you would use a programming language to direct a data processing system, you use the job control language to direct an operating system. Job management processes the JCL and communicates your job requirements to the rest of the operating system. Now, in order to effectively code JCL, it is important to understand the functions of job management. So let's see what these functions are. Job management is responsible for reading jobs into the system. 
By scheduling jobs here, we mean selecting a job according to its priority for processing. Allocating I.O. resources involves the, the assigning of I.O. units to a program and the setting aside of output space on direct access storage devices. When a program terminates, the resources that were allocated are freed and made available for the use of other programs. By initiating jobs and job steps, we mean requesting the execution of the programs named in those job steps. Job management is also responsible for writing job output independently of the program that produced it. Now, all of these functions here, up to this point, make up what is called a job processing cycle. Every job processed by the system passes through these steps. Later on in a videotape, we will follow a job through the job processing cycle. Finally, job management is also responsible for handling two-way communication with the operator. Commands issued by the operator are executed, and messages issued by the system are displayed at the console. In general, then, the job management routines handle all the work that is necessary to prepare for the execution of the programs that accomplish your job and to clean up after execution is complete. Task management, on the other hand, is responsible for actually getting a program into execution and monitoring its progress. Thus, task management performs such functions as program loading and in a multi-programming environment where many programs occupy storage at the same time, switching control of the CPU from program to program. It is called task management because once a program is ready for execution, it is referred to as a task. Now, let's look at data management. What does it do? Well, it relieves the programmer of a complex programming burden by providing routines to locate his data sets and space for his data sets, and by providing I.O. routines called access methods to manage the movement of data between internal and external storage. The programs that comprise OS reside in data sets called system data sets. System data sets reside on a direct access device called the system's residence device, or SysRes, or sometimes the system's residence pack, for short. Actually, some of the data sets can be placed on other devices, but for the sake of simplicity, we will assume that they are all stored on a single device. Data sets in which programs reside, are in which programs are stored, are called program libraries. Programs which are to be loaded into storage for execution must be stored in program libraries which reside on direct access devices. Now, there are three kinds of program libraries. The first kind is the system library. A system library is a system data set. It is always open to users of the system. The system library in which the processing programs are stored is called sys1.linklib. Now, the second kind of program library is a private library. Programs not used frequently enough to be stored on the system library are placed here. A private library need only be placed online when the programs it contains are to be executed. The third kind of a library is a temporary library. This type of library is created, used, and deleted within a single job. A typical use of this library is in the creation and testing of a new program. In the link edit step of a typical compile, link edit, and execute procedure, the linkage editor places the load module into a temporary library. After the program is executed, the library is deleted and its space made available for other data sets. Now, problem programs can be loaded into storage from any of these three libraries.
In a multi-programming operating system, many programs can occupy storage simultaneously. Control of the CPU, however, can be in only one program at a time. With many programs in storage competing for CPU time, someone has to decide who gets control of the CPU next. Now that someone is a part of the control program called the supervisor. The switching of control from one program to another always occurs as the result of an interruption. Now since the supervisor cannot predict when an interruption will take place, a part of it must always be resident to handle the interruption when it occurs. That part of the supervisor, which must always be resident, is called the nucleus. The nucleus resides in a system data, data set called, appropriate, appropriately enough, sys1.nucleus. The nucleus is loaded into storage by a process called initial program load, or IPL. In this process, the operator dials the address of the system's residence device into the dials on the console, then presses the load button. As a result, a series of instructions are executed, which culminates in the loading of the nucleus into storage. Problem programs execute out of the remaining area of storage. All the processing programs execute here as well as the non-resident parts of the operating system, which are brought into storage as required. Now let's see how a problem program gets loaded into storage. The loading routine is part of the nucleus. It retrieves a program from a program library. In this case, let's assume sys1.linklive, and then makes the necessary changes to the address constants in the program so that it can be loaded into any available storage. While we still have a problem program in storage, let's see how it gets its I.O. accomplished. In order to perform I.O., an access method is required. If the access method is not already in storage, the supervisor will have to get it for us. The access methods reside in a system data set. When the programmer is ready to process data, he issues an open macro in assembler language or some equivalent in a high-level language. The open macro causes control to be passed to the supervisor, which in turn loads the access method. In some systems, the access methods are resident and need not be loaded. At the point where a record is needed, the problem program issues the get macro or some other equivalent. The get results in a branch to the access method. If the desired record is already in storage, the access method gives the record or its location to the problem program. If not, the access method first reads the record into storage and then gives it to the problem program. We have said that the nucleus occupies the lower end of main storage and that problem programs execute out of the remaining area of storage. The various configurations of OS differ mainly in the way they manage the use of this area. Let's first look at MFT. In this configuration, storage is divided up into a fixed number of fixed size pieces called partitions. A program to be executed is loaded into a partition and executes there concurrently with programs in other partitions. Now each installation chooses partition sizes to accommodate their own programs. Since not all programs slated for a partition will be the same size, a certain amount of partition space will be wasted. The size and number of partitions is determined at system generation time. Changing the size and number of partitions requires the intervention of the operator. You can see that the number of programs or tasks 
which can execute concurrently is determined by the number of partitions. And since these are fixed, we have multiprogramming with a fixed number of tasks, or MFT. In the MVT configuration, this area of storage is not divided into a fixed number of fixed size partitions. Instead, the system automatically and dynamically acquires an area of storage of sufficient size to accommodate the program about to be loaded and then loads the program into that area. This area is called a region. How does the system know how large an area to acquire? It doesn't, but you can specify this in your JCL. You can see that the number and size of regions will vary in time. Thus, we have multiprogramming with a variable number of tasks, or MVT. Now, let's look at virtual systems. In order to show you the highly dynamic nature of storage management in these systems, this topic is presented on animated film. Let's watch. In most conventional computer systems, main storage is arbitrarily divided into areas of fixed sizes, which are allocated to running different programs. We have some big programs we'd like to run now, but the way main storage is allocated, we simply can't fit them in. Sure, we could reallocate storage, but that would disrupt all the jobs that are in the system. We can't get the production jobs out on time because they keep throwing rush jobs at us. We'd like to extend our system with terminals to serve some remote users. But getting that online program into the system would be a real problem. We would have to have a lot more main storage. For such requirements, merely adding more main storage is not a total solution because that can introduce the problem of redesigning and reprogramming applications to make efficient use of the increased storage space. All of this must be done by the programmer. In designing an application, the programmer has, in effect, a writing surface whose size is limited by the portion of main storage allocated to the job. When the application is bigger than the writing surface, the programmer must create a series of programs or a single program with multiple segments and then write additional instructions to tell the system how to keep track of the segments, where they break, and how to connect them. The programmer can no longer think only about the application, but also has to worry about managing storage space for program instructions and data. The challenge then is to enlarge the writing surface. If it were big enough, the programmer wouldn't have to divide his application into pieces, and the problem of storage management would disappear. All the programmer has to do now is to write his program on this enlarged surface, however long, however complicated. He just writes the program and leaves the job of storage management to the system. The system compiles the program and loads it into a very large space, which, like the main storage of a conventional computer, contains the program, both data and instructions, during execution. This space may be thought of as being physically located on a direct access storage device. The system automatically divides this storage space into small areas called pages. And since these pages will have to fit into the real storage of the computer, the system divides that into matching frames. Not large partitions, but small page size frames. Now, at execution time, 
the system assigns virtual storage pages of the program to real storage locations as the pages are required for processing. That costly space now can be kept filled. When additional programs are loaded, they can share real storage because the system dynamically allocates page frames to active programs according to their needs. The transfer of pages to and from real storage is handled automatically by the system while the jobs continue running. Since real storage now can be fully and efficiently utilized, the CPU can be kept busy executing programs, and in most cases, the system can get more work done. Now we can run large programs at any time, without being restricted by the size or structure of real storage. Rush jobs can be handled without canceling the production work. Since the system now takes care of fitting the program into storage, we can easily extend applications to service more and more online users. This entire process of coordination and timing, the dividing of programs into pages, the loading of virtual storage, the transfer of pages to and from real storage, all of it is transparent to the programmer. His sole concern now is his application. The filling of real storage, the dividing of his program, the ordering of the pages, all are lifted from the programmer's shoulders. All can be handled by the CPU hardware facilities and system control programming of System 370. Now we have two kinds of storage that we can talk about. One that has no real physical existence, which we call virtual storage, and one that does, which we will now call real storage. Now we have looked at the different configurations of OS. What effect do these differences in configuration have on your JCL coding? Very little, really. There are just a few parameters required in some systems that are not required in others. Now that we have built the operating system, let's trace the flow of a job through the job processing cycle. We start off by defining our job with the job control language statements, or JCL. The illustrations we will use will show the statements in card format. We use a job card to mark the beginning of the job and to identify it. The identification here is job A. The two slashes indicate this is a control card. And the word job identifies it as a job control card. For each program we wish to execute, we must supply an execute card naming that program. This card calls for the execution of a program named PROG1. A data definition card, or DD card, must be supplied to define each data set to be used by the program. The DD cards provide the information the system needs to locate input data sets and to provide space for output data sets on direct access storage devices. Let's assume that our first program will read a card data set. We can include the data set right in with our JCL following the DD card defining the card data set. This data will be read from the system input device, thus avoiding the need for a separate I.O. device. Note 
the data cards do not contain the double slashes that identify the JCL cards. An execute card and its accompanying DD cards define a single step of a job. A job may require the execution of several programs, in which case the job would contain multiple steps. The steps of a job are executed serially. Normally, we would include in a job steps that are related by input and output. That is, the output of one step becomes the input of another step. We will assume that the other steps of the job already exist in the, in the form of predefined JCL. The predefined steps are called a procedure and have been stored by name, standard proc, in a procedure library called sys1.proclib. The name is used to locate and extract the procedure from the library whenever it is needed. If we wish to include this procedure as part of our job definition, we place an execute card naming the procedure at the point we would like the predefined JCL to appear in our JCL. The job card defining the next job, identified here as job B, signals the end of the JCL for our job. The job we submit and job submitted by others are stacked together to form an input stream to the operating system, which is placed in the system input device, in this case, a card reader. Now let's follow job A through the job processing cycle. The input stream is read by a job management routine called a reader. Now any data encountered in the input stream is placed on a direct access device. Now why do we do this? Well, if we left the data in the input stream, we would have to wait until the program read it before we could read in the next job. We could execute only one job at a time, and this would deal our efforts to multiprogram a mortal blow. So I have to get the data out of the way to permit the reader to read in several jobs. As the jobs are read in, they are placed in a waiting line called the job queue. The jobs are maintained in the queue in the order of their priorities. Here we show two jobs already in the queue. Job A is at the head of the queue because it has a higher priority than job B. Now when job C is entered with a priority of 10, it will be sequenced between job A and job B, like so. Where does the reader get the priority information from? You must supply the value in the priority parameter of the job card. Now let's leave the reader busily stacking jobs in the job queue. To get jobs ready for execution, another job management routine called the initiator is required. Now, the initiator selects the highest priority job from the job queue. In this case, job A would be chosen since, since it has the highest priority. What do you think OS does with jobs of equal priority? Well, it does what's fair. It chooses the job of equal priority that entered the job queue first. That's the FIFO rule, first in, first out. Next, the initiator selects the first step of the job and determines what I.O. resources are required for this step. It obtains this information from the DD cards. Now here we show tape and disk units being allocated. 
How does the initiator know what I.O. resources to allocate? You must provide unit, volume, and space information in the DD card for each data set. Still another resource is required. That is the program. The initiator obtains the name of the program from the execute card. But remember, loading and executing the program is not the function of job management. So the initiator calls on task management and passes along the name of the program. Task management loads this name program from a program library and gives it control of the CPU. When the program gets control, it reads and writes to its allocated I.O. devices. The data it would have read from the input stream is read instead from the direct access storage device on which it was stored. In a similar way, data destined for the output stream can be written onto the direct access storage device rather than directly to a system output device such as the printer. When the program terminates, control is returned to the initiator via task management. The initiator frees up the resources that are no longer needed. Here we so show the I.O. devices being deallocated. The initiator continues with the next job step and eventually with the next job. When job management selects the second step of job A, it encounters an execute card which calls for the use of a procedure, not a program. In our case, the procedure called is named standard proc. The system uses the procedure name to locate and extract the procedure from the library. The procedure virtually replaces the execute card, which called it. The JCL in the procedure is processed just as if it had been in the input stream in the first place. But wait, we are not yet finished with this job. We have job A's output stream data sitting out here on this direct access device. How does this data get recorded? That is the purpose of a job management routine called the writer. The writer reads the output stream data from a completed job and records the data on a system output device of your choice. How does the writer know which system output device to choose? You must specify the device in the DD card for that data set. Now that completes the processing for job A. So let's take a few minutes now to summarize what we have done in this video presentation. We started off by examining what elements make up the operating system and the functions that these elements perform. You saw where the operating system resides and how it gets loaded by the IPL procedure. You also saw where programs reside and how they get loaded and executed and how they accomplish their input and output. You now know that there are different configurations of OS and what the major difference is between these configurations. You also know that these differences have a minimal effect on how you code your JCL. Finally, we created a job stream and saw examples of the kind of information you can specify in your JCL. You then saw how job management uses this information to process your job by following a job through the job processing cycle. 
you should now be familiar enough with the basics of the operating system to be able to continue your study.